So we're going to start um, with uh, Karima, who you've will be introduced uh, uh, yesterday, um, and um, she's going to talk about your fatwa does not apply here. Yeah, great. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Karima. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming out this early on a Sunday morning. I thought maybe when I got here, uh, it would be me, Mariam, and Maria May sitting here very tired. And I'm delighted that, in fact, we're all together, perhaps all very tired. But, but thank you so much for coming. And I want to start out by really thanking Mariam and Maria May for creating this wonderful space. And I hope we'll all take the chance to thank them. And I also want to thank all the people who work with them, all the technical staff who are also here early on a Sunday morning, the people at the table outside, uh, and, and so on. It's just been wonderful. Um, and this space is especially meaningful to me because I teach in the US Academy, which is full of post-colonial theorists and putative feminists writing books like Do Muslim Women Need Saving? I don't know if anyone knows about this book. It is now following me around. Everywhere I go, I'm asked about this book. This book actually attacks women human rights defenders on the ground fighting for their rights who apparently didn't get the memo that they were supposed to shut up and serve as a trope for academic theorists far, far away. So that's the environment. Um, many of my other colleagues, lovely people, liberal and left legal theorists, are busy defending Sharia law, glorifying the veil, in, which we're told is actually a celebration of female sexuality. I can give you the citation on that. Um, so being in that environment is very isolating, and, and being here is, has just been really wonderful with sort of more or less like-minded people, and I will come to the more or less uh, part in a moment. Um, and I think it is healthy that we agree about many things, but not about everything, because after all, we are a coalition, and we are committed to heterodoxy and the idea that it is fine to disagree. Um, and there were so many important things said yesterday that I went home and threw out my talk at about 11 o'clock in the morning uh, last night, which is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, but I wrote, rewrote a new one trying to incorporate many of the things that had been said and perhaps push in some other directions that we didn't get to address um, last night. So, and I'm also hoping that my technique with the clicker has improved since yesterday morning. Um, yesterday I talked about loss in the fight against the religious right, and I was very struck when I got back to my room after the lovely dinner that there has of course been more loss as we were here speaking. Yesterday, 35 people were killed in car bombs in Baghdad. Uh, the death toll in Kobani is rising. We don't know what will happen there. Uh, so that suffering goes on. Uh, and my sort of anger at seeing those images when I got back last night, uh, as well as my thoughts about our discussion yesterday, made me realize what I really wanted to talk about today is both resistance and strategy. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have a lot to say about that. I hope we'll talk a lot about strategy today. So the title for my talk uh, comes from the title for my book, which you see here, uh, Your Fetwa Does Not Apply Here. And I, I think it's really not just about the sorrow and the suffering, which is in many of the stories, uh, but it really is about the defiance. Uh, and some of the people in the book are here if you want to know more about their stories and their work. Uh, Fetou So, who spoke yesterday, Maria May is in the book, Horia Masadik from Afghanistan, who's here, their stories are in the book. And you heard some of the others during the In Memoriam yesterday. Um, but I wanted to mention the source, let's see, there we go, the source of the title of the book, uh, which comes from the writing, the wonderful writing of Shahid Nadim, the Pakistani playwright who's the resident writer for the Ajoka Theater Company in Lahore. And this is a theater company that has faced threats, that has faced public denunciations, that has faced the banning of their productions due to uh, the calls by jamaat e islami and yet they still continue to take on fundamentalism right in the heart of their work. And I adapted my title, or stole my title, would be a less polite way of saying it, from one of the lines in uh, Shahid's play for a joke called Boulay, which is about the renowned 18th century Sufi mystic Boulay Shah, and you see 
a representation of Boulay Shah here on the right. And you see the text that I'm going to refer to there on the left. That's Madiha Gauhar, the theater company's uh, director. And in one of the scenes from this play about Boulay Shah, when his young disciples are playing music and singing, they are approached by a religious teacher who tells them they have to stop playing music and rebuffs them saying, you know, we have this religious order, you can't play this music. And one of the young disciples, you see it here, the last line, Sona says, your fetwas do not apply here. Um, and I took the line from there really just to kind of reflect on and underscore this idea that resistance is in fact indigenous everywhere. And I think that is all too often overlooked. Uh, and that's where the line comes. I actually had to fight to keep that as the title for the paperback edition because I guess it's considered controversial, uh, but it, it comes right there from uh, that play written by somebody living and presenting his work on the front line. Um, now, I won't tell too many stories from my book today. I actually interviewed about 300 people from Afghanistan to Mali. Some of you have heard me speak before or you've seen uh, the TED Talk, or if you want more stories from the book, you can, you can go to the TED Talk. But I just want to say a few things about the book and then use that to move on to the question of strategy. And one of the things that I can't stop saying enough is how diverse the people that I met were. And I think Kanan Malik yesterday was absolutely right how important it is to emphasize diversities sort of within all the categories we use as a key piece of our work. So I interviewed sheikhs, religious scholars, I interviewed bloggers. I interviewed stay-at-home moms, we would call them in the US, housewives, I interviewed sexual rights activists. I interviewed people who excuse themselves to pray in the middle of interviews, and I interviewed others who were drinking wine to toast the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad, which is a big holiday in North Africa, <laughs> though the fundamentalists don't think much of this holiday. Um, just a few of the specific people that I met. I interviewed, um, well, there you see, this is actually an interview in Mali. I interviewed uh, a woman named, a young woman named Amina Tudauda, who you see here, who is the daughter of an imam in Niger who actively promotes the CEDAW Convention, which Niger has ratified and the United States has not. Uh, and she believes that to be entirely reconcilable with her religious faith. So she approaches this from within a religious paradigm while also using international human rights law. I also interviewed the wonderful Deep Saida of the Pakistan Institute for Peace and Secularism Studies, uh, an avowed atheist who organizes demonstrations against Taliban abuses and terrorist atrocities in Lahore, despite being threatened regularly and told that suicide bombers will come to her events. She often replies, I've seen her do this on the phone, uh, you know, come if you must, we'll be there too. <laughs> and the question I really wondered when I met all of these people doing all of this kind of work was why are they not more recognized internationally? And that's something I want to think about all day today. How do we change that? You know, why is it that everyone knows who bin Laden was, but so few know about all of these people standing up to the bin Ladens of their own context? Um, although listening to Gita Sagal yesterday, I realized bin Laden is passe. That's I've been saying this now for a year, and I should probably be talking about the self-declared so-called caliph Baghdadi instead. But nevertheless, I think part of the problem is that the people I wrote about, many of the people who are here, are not on the script that either the right or the left or the media uses to talk about these countries and these regions and these conflicts. And I think one of the key tasks in front of us is to change that script. You know, this is not a West versus the rest. This is a Democrats versus the theocrats everywhere. But nobody's really listening to the voices of the Democrats. The theocrats get all the airtime. Uh, and so I think we have to rewrite this script. And a key part of that is listening to the voices of those who are really living all of this. And we got to do a lot of that yesterday, which I think is really important. Oh, dear. I thought my clicker technique had gotten better. There we go. Oh, and there is one of Deep's demonstrations. Um, so when my book was coming out a year ago, I was trying to figure out how to present it to American audiences, what to say exactly. And I wrote to a former student of mine in Tunisia, a brilliant young woman lawyer, and asked her what she would say in the current moment to American audiences about the local resistance to fundamentalism uh, in her country. And Nahda was still in power at that time. And she said, if I have something to say to Americans, and I think this would go for Westerners generally, it would be to ask them to wake up. 
Americans have to stop considering that the nightmare that we are living under the rule of these fundamentalists is a part of our culture and identity, and that being oppressed by fundamentalists is all that we are entitled to, and that this nightmare is a moderate one just because we don't yet have stoning and amputations as punishments. We are tired of paying the bill for the West's misperception and misrepresentation of the reality. And I think it's so important to listen to voices like that. It gives you a sense of the really strong feeling in many of the, the regions and affected countries at the moment about how sort of wrong uh, the international perception is of what is happening uh, on their particular front lines. It also suggests how deep the resistance uh, runs. Now, I'm using the word fundamentalisms, and I will cite Maria May's wonderful definition uh, here. So political movements of the extreme right which in a context of globalization manipulate religion to achieve their political aims. Um, and I, to me, this definition is very important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the S, so we're talking about multiple fundamentalisms here in many of the world's great religious traditions, but also the important idea that what we're talking about here is a politics and an extreme right politics masquerading uh, as uh, uh, Imam uh, Targay said yesterday, masquerading as uh, religion, and it's really a right-wing politics. Now, I feel like we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about religion, which is very useful and important. It's important to have the space to have a critical debate about religion, but I really want to talk about politics uh, today and, and the politics that masquerades as that uh, religion. So uh, for me, what is happening right now really has a lot more to do with that uh, politics. Um, so I want to think about the strategies for fighting that politics and sort of the alternative politics. Um, but I also wanted to say, oh God, I wrote this at two in the morning. I hope it still seems like a good idea now. Um, I wanted to say as an aside with, I hope it will be understood, great friendship and great respect that I wanted to respond to a few things that were said yesterday um, and hope that we can have a discussion about them and think about them going forward. One of the things that concerned me at times, and I don't want to overstate this at all, it was a great day yesterday, but at times it seemed to me that there was a presumption of a shared atheist stance, and that in a space like this, that is at best unhelpful and at worst downright alienating to some people and some potential allies. Now, many of us are atheists and many of us are not. Uh, and we all deserve respect. Um, and I have to say, I would defend to my last breath the right to be an atheist and the contribution that atheists have made across these regions and globally to the struggle against the religious right is, is absolutely huge um, and incredible. But I, I want to reiterate something that was said yesterday, both by al Hamania and also by Nadia al Feni in the debate in her film on TV, which is that secularism and atheism are not the same thing. And I think we have to be very careful about not projecting a confusion uh, about that because it totally pulls the carpet under the out from under the feet of religious believers who share our secular commitments, and we certainly do not want to do that. Uh, secularism is not the same thing as opposition to religious belief, although that too is an honorable stance. It's just a different one. It may be a related one, but it's a different one. And secularism is not the belitt belittling of religious belief either, though it certainly involves the ability to speak critically and to question all aspects of religion. Um, so one of the things I think we need to look for, and I think we did a lot of this yesterday, but I just wanted to underscore the importance of an inclusive language of mutual respect that builds the bridges that we need for all of these critical alliances now amongst secularists who are agnostic, atheist, uh, believers, free thinkers, who look at the universe in whatever way they choose to look at the universe, uh, but share the commitment to secularism. I don't believe that there is any such thing as moderate fundamentalism. I don't believe there is any such thing as moderate theocratic stances or, of course, the great canard moderate Islamism that we're always hearing about. I don't believe that those things exist. But personally, I do believe that moderate religion, a term that was used yesterday, exists in many places, or tolerant religion, you could call it, or open religion, or humanist religion, just as oppressive religion exists as well. And if you know me at all, you know how ironic it is that I'm giving this speech, because most of the time I spend my time in the US fighting to get the sort of predominance of religious language and religious discourse out so we can actually you know, talk about secularism and, and, and human rights. But sort of this wonderful free space has kind of pushed me to want to put these things uh, 
back on the agenda. Um, for me, and I think Maria May made this point yesterday afternoon, religion is not just about static texts, it's not just about repressive institutions, but it's what human beings choose to do with those texts and through or in spite of those institutions. Um, and I think here of my good friends in, if I can advance the slide, oh dear, there we go, whoops. My good friends in Muslims for Progressive Values in the US who actually perform same-sex Muslim marriages in California uh, and whose discourse is incredibly progressive and within their interpretation uh, of religion. I, I also think of, and I can't show you his picture because he asked me not to, I think of someone I call in the book the liberal mullah of Herat who risks his life every day in Western Afghanistan to carry out women's human rights seminars using his view of religious education for women to combat early and forced marriage. This is an elderly man who calls himself a women's rights defender. Now, his idea of women's rights and mine might not be exactly the same thing. I absolutely acknowledge that. And I do believe that there are limits and dangers to working inside religion. I absolutely, and we can talk about that. But I also value and respect this kind of work tremendously. And what I wanted to say is, you know, our team is outnumbered in every way. And we have to remain true to our core principles, but we need as many people as possible on that team. And I have to take a drink, sorry. I also wanted to um, take up the topic of, oops, there we go. I also wanted to take up the topic, the difficult topic of racism and religious discrimination. And again, I usually find myself in the role of arguing that anti-racism should not be used to silence critique of the Muslim right as it all too often is. And we heard another distressing example of this from academia yesterday with the student union refusal to criticize ISIS. But here in this space, I also just wanted to remind us what we all know of the terrible context that so many of us find ourselves working on these issues in, in the West. Personally now, every time that I write something about people of Muslim heritage fighting against fundamentalism, the comments are filled not with Islamist hate, but with hatred of Islam and of Muslims expressed by Westerners. In fact, I'm now told this because I no longer read the comments because I found it so distressing. At one point I was writing about an Algerian TV producer uh, who is a paraplegic now because of an attack on him by the armed Islamic group and the comment section was just filled with this loathing of Islam and uh, of Muslims. So I don't read this stuff, but this is what I'm told. And you know, we all know this, this is the context we're working in. And so the challenge is finding a way to absolutely keep criticizing the religious right, not to moderate our denunciations of this extreme politics, uh, but also at the same time to speak out loudly and clearly against the very real problem of discrimination against Muslims and other targeted groups depending on the context uh, and against immigrants. It seems to me this is a matter of basic principle and also of strategy and we cannot cede that ground to the opponents of secularism, uh, which is what, is what is happening, unfortunately. Uh, and we're now seeing, you know, in the U.S. that there are some, and I stress this, some prominent atheists who are using that banner as a cover for these just generalizing statements and attacks on Muslims and Islam that really risk giving aid and comfort to the far right in the West. And I, you know, I really ask people to talk to their atheist friends to please, uh, in the US, please rethink that stance because what it does is feed into a clash of civilizations, mentality, it confirms the slanders of our opponents about what secularism is, and it ultimately can undermine the struggles of those against fundamentalism on the front lines. It's also a gift to jihadists, actually, who capitalize on the perception of grievance. So it's absolutely critical to speak about all fundamentalisms, um, and I'm not advocating in any way making easy comparisons between them, but um, I, I do think fundamentalism is a problem everywhere. There's a reason Maria May used an S, and I am delighted we're gonna be talking later today about Jewish fundamentalism, about the Hindu right, about Sinhala Buddhist ethno-nationalism, as it's called in the program, uh, because while Islamism does pose especially severe challenges transnationally in the current moment, these are all key pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to take apart and remake. Uh, and I think it is so helpful to those of us doing this work uh, among people of Muslim heritage to have that other work uh, represented as well. 
So um, now that I've probably sort of managed to turn off and offend people and say things that you know already, um, <laughs> but I did that because I know this is a safe space for debate, and I just want to make sure those things are on our agenda. Let me return to the issue of strategy, and I just want to suggest uh, a few things that in my view, and we can all have a discussion about this, what people think, what we should be doing now, what we need to be focusing now, on now, if we are all in agreement that what we want to do is defeat the religious right, that we may have different approaches to that, what are some of the things that we can, should, must try to do together toward that end? Well, one of the things I think we need to do, and this came up a lot yesterday, is to try to go after the funding sources of the fundamentalist groups. I don't have time to say much about how to do that here, but I think we need to do a lot of brainstorming about it. Um, during my book research, I heard endless complaining from people, from Mali to Pakistan, about Saudi funding in particular. And yet, when you go and try to look for forensic information about Saudi funding documentation so that you can make that case internationally, it's very difficult to get your hands on it. So that documentation work is something that we need to start doing, and that work of exposing those sources of funding for whatever fundamentalist movements, uh, and taking it on, and trying to get sanctioned applied to the sources of that funding, I think that's incredibly important. Uh, we also need to unequivocally defend women's rights, and we talked a lot about this yesterday, but I just think it's so important to always remember that gender equality is not some side issue, and I worry that it is going to get pushed to the side now in the era of the war against ISIS, uh, but it's a critical piece of the campaign against fundamentalism, which can in fact only succeed by taking on this issue. Um, another thing that I wanted to say here as a, a professor of international law, I can't help myself, is that we also have to make the case continuously that the campaign against fundamentalism, including the campaign against ISIS now, has to itself respect international law. Um, you know, all of the military action taken, the detentions and so on, uh, have to respect human rights. And this is essential for reasons both moral and strategic, because any abuses committed become recruitment tools for the very jihadists that we are fighting. Um, I was going to sort of make a whole side uh, address here about Bill Maher and Ben Affleck, but <laughs> I'm not sure how much that debate has actually crossed the ocean. So I'm thinking of, it has, it has. Okay, well, Bill Maher it is then. Uh, I'll try to really shorten this though because I want to get right back into the strategy. Um, but this goes to this sort of whole difficult question about how we position ourselves in uh, the strategy, where we find a space. Uh, to take some of the perspectives that we are talking about. And for those of you who don't know uh, this, about this, uh, Bill Maher is a very prominent, often very brilliant political comedian in the United States um, who, uh, who is an atheist, who has been absolutely right in a lot of his critique about right-wing politics uh, in the U.S., big supporter of gay rights, uh, made a documentary about religion called Religulous, um, which is very interesting until you get to the part about Islam when suddenly he interviews Geert Wilders, the far right-wing Dutch anti-immigration politician. And on October 3rd, so about two weeks ago, um, sorry, a week ago, about 10 days ago, uh, he sort of went into a rant, an anti-Islam, anti-Muslims rant, basically accusing Islam of being sort of uniquely evil among religions and most Muslims as being kind of in agreement with ISIS, and you can see some of the uh, text here. And this has completely dominated the debate now in the US. Of all the things I've written, this is the one thing that people are reading because it's about TV, right? And everybody watches uh, TV, so I do think it is important to, to respond. Um, my worry now is because this critique has been put out there in an offensive way, there will now be less critique of fundamentalism because progressives are yet again going to assume that you know you, you have to the, the anti-racist stance is not to criticize fundamentalism. Whereas my problem with Marr is not at all that he did that. It's the generalizations uh, that he made along with it, and it's the kind of the singling out um, on the show. So then the actor Ben Affleck, who some of you may know, uh, took on Marr from the kind of liberal left U.S. position, and I was very grateful to him for doing this in a very sort of angry way because some of the assertions that were being made were so offensive. Maher said things like, no Muslims are speaking out against fundamentalism. Here you see, uh, they're all too afraid. Um, and Ben Affleck really pushed back, which was great, except that what he did was to tr 
Wait a minute, that's not right at all. I started 15 minutes ago. <laughs> um, I can stop talking at any moment, I'm happy, but I, um, oh dear. That, that's all up to you. So, um, so Ben Affleck's response to this then is to downplay fundamentalism, to say that ISIS couldn't fill a double A ballpark in Charlotte. I mean, this is just not true and it doesn't help uh, either, and I wrote this piece called Why Ben Affleck and Bill Maher Are Both Wrong. And you know, this kind of downplaying of fundamentalism is almost as troubling to me as the Maher critique. And the challenge is to find something else, right? To find another discourse. What I'm trying to argue is what we do need is a very principled, very vocal, anti-racist critique of Muslim fundamentalism that pulls no punches, but that also distinguishes between Islam, which is a diverse religious tradition, one of the great religious traditions in the world, and Islamism, which is the extreme right-wing political ideology. Um, and that distinction is getting lost here altogether. But what we don't need to lose is the idea that it is acceptable uh, to critique. And I'm very worried uh, that that is going to happen. So anyway, I was going to talk a little bit about personal experience and tell a few more stories, but I'm not going to do that because I'm going to jump forward to come back to strategy. And while I'm talking about strategy, maybe I'll keep this wonderful picture up there of the Algerian rally of democratic women protesting on the streets of Algiers in 1994 against the assassination of intellectuals by the armed Islamic group. They could have been killed at any moment, and there they were. So we'll keep them as a backdrop uh, while I am closing on the theme of strategy. So what, what do we do? Now, I think Caroline Fouras was absolutely right yesterday morning that we need to promote secularism and not waste time comparing religious texts. I, I agree with this completely. I also think we have to be both strategic and disciplined. Uh, they know that's a dangerous word, but <laughs> our fundamentalist opponents are very, uh, very disciplined. Um, we, we have to build structures. We have to raise money. We have to gain access to the media. Uh, we have to find spaces of unity where we can work across the spectrum with, uh, I already talked about this, you know, people from believers to atheists. We have to work together transnationally. This is incredibly important. This is part of why this gathering is so important. The fundamentalists are doing this. Read, there's a great book called The Politics of Reproduction about the, the activism of Muslim and Christian fundamentalists together at the international level in conferences about uh, women's rights. We have got to do more. Many of us are already doing this, but we have to build more structures to do that work. Um, and we have to be very creative with no budget. Look at this conference. Look what they achieved with such a small budget. We have, it's amazing. So my question is, you know, who's gonna, who out there is gonna organize the next meeting like this? Perhaps in another country, in another region. We have to pick up this baton now and run with it. Um, we really have to sort of think about specifically what we need to do, what we need to do together, how to do it. Uh, I think about the very first interview I did for my book with poor Maria May. I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't get the digital recorder turned on. Um, but she said some very interesting things to me. She said, look, there is individual resistance, and that is not the problem. But the conditions are not there for it to move to a higher level, to a truly political level. And I think that's what we have to focus on. How do we get this kind of coalescing of these individual resistances? Um, Shahla Shafiq, who's an Iranian sociologist, told me we need more networks of solidarity and reflection. Again, she said there are many good things being done, but they don't converge. And we have to figure out how to make that convergence happen in spaces like this. Maria May again identified to me some of the specific things that we need to do to get organized in this way. We need money, and we've really got to think about you know, where we can begin to, to find that, how we can work without it, and so on. We need media outlets, uh, and we need to make very strategic use of the media outlets, the wonderful media outlets like Open Democracy that we're lucky enough to have access to. But we need more. Uh, we need access to newspapers, radio, TV, perhaps our own. We need to seize this moment of opportunity. This is something else that Maria May stressed when I interviewed her for Open Democracy last week. Um, there is a window now to speak about these things because of ISIS, because of the global condemnation of the crimes against humanity committed by ISIS. The issues are not being presented in the way that many of us uh, would, but I think we really have to act very urgently now to take advantage of this moment, especially, of course, to support those who are threatened by ISIS on the ground, but to address these issues in a much bigger way. Now, when I asked the people that I met 
what we could do to support them globally, I received a range of answers. Some said clearly support secular feminist groups and the principle of universal rights. So I think a big piece of this is defending the notion of universality. Some said support actions taken on the ground to counter fundamentalist indoctrination. And I think we have to think a lot about this issue of indoctrination and, and how to counter it. Um, provide financial assistance to forces so as to enable them to do their work. Give them visibility. Unpack the myth of the moderate Islamist, especially when it comes to the rights of women, freedom of expression, and freedom of religion. Um, a lot more I could say here, but I'm, I'm just going to skip forward. I think, you know, the fact that the fundamentalist message sometimes comes through so clearly is much more a matter of having the resources to amplify it rather than it's actually representing any kind of dominant popular view much of anywhere in the world. And so what we have to get into is the loudspeaker distribution business, right? How do we make sure that those voices out there are, are actually being heard? We need to translate what they're, there is so much amazing stuff being written in Urdu, in Farsi, in Arabic, in French, in Russian. We're not reading it. It's not making it into English. We need to translate. We need to bring people here to speak, including people who can't speak English, and provide translation for them. We need to find ways to support those who are at risk. I was really moved by Gita and Taslima's debate, discussion, dialogue last night about Taslima's feeling that she just really didn't get support when she was forced into exile by fundamentalist threats. We need to be organized uh, to respond very quickly in those cases uh, transnationally. So there is so much that we need to do here today. And I want to ask you, please, while I'm talking now, Write down one thing. You can do a lot more than this, but write down one thing you are going to commit to doing as a follow-up to this conference. And maybe in a couple of weeks or in a couple of months when you've done it, you know, tweet to Secular Conference and tell us you know, what you did. You can do many more things than one, but write down one for sure that you're going to do. And I'll tell you, here's my one, and I'm going to try to do much more, but here's my one if I can advance the slide, which I guess I'm going to learn to use PowerPoint. That's my one thing I'm going to do as a follow-up. No, I am going to try to get this wonderful book distributed to as many U.S. university libraries as possible. This is a book that was supposed to be here at the conference, but unfortunately Amazon let us down and didn't get it. It's edited by Maria May. It's called The Struggle for Secularism in Europe and North America, Women from Migrant Descent Facing the Rise of Fundamentalism. You can get it on Amazon.com. Uh, That's my thing I'm going to contribute to uh, following up, trying to get this in as, in as many U.S. university libraries as possible. But think of whatever your thing is um, and, and write it down. Um, and I'm going to end, after all of that harangue, with one last story, because I just want to go back to where I started, which is with suffering and resistance, uh, so that we all take away with us just a reminder of what we all know, which is how much is at stake. Because I think stories and faces and names convey that in a way that generalities never can. Um, if you've seen the TED Talk or you've heard me speak before, my apologies, you've heard this story before, uh, but I always come back to it as a touchstone uh, because it's the story of a law student and I am a law professor. So this is the story of Amel Zanun Zawani, who was a 22-year-old law student in Algeria in the 1990s who had exactly the same dreams of a legal career that I had. And she absolutely refused to give up her studies, despite the fact that the fundamentalist groups battling the Algerian state threatened anyone who continued their education in the way that Boko Haram does today, and even more systematically. On January 26, 1997, ML Zanoun boarded the bus in Algiers where she was studying to go home and spend a Ramadan evening with her family. And she would never finish law school. When the bus arrived outside her hometown, it was stopped at a checkpoint manned by men from the armed Islamic group who were at the time claiming to battle the Algerian state but were in fact waging a war on civilians. ML was carrying her school bag between her feet and so she was easily identifiable as a student on that January 1997 day. She was taken off the bus and she was killed in the street in front of all of the other passengers. Now, I thought about this a lot yesterday. If you saw Nadia el brilliant film when the demonstrators were doing this, because Amel Zanoun, like many Algerians, was killed by having her throat cut. And that is exactly what those young Tunisian Salafists uh, were referring to. Now, the men who killed Amel then turned to everyone on the bus and they said, if you go to the university, the day will come when we will kill all of you just like this. 
Can you advance the slide, please? Thank you very much. Now, Amal Zanoon died at exactly 5.17 p.m., which we know because when her throat was cut, she fell in the street and her watch broke at exactly that moment, and this is her watch, which her mother showed to me. And the thing I'm always struck by is the way the second hand is still aimed optimistically upward toward a 5.18 that would never come for Emil. Shortly before her death, she had said to your, her mother, please put this in your head, Mom. She was talking about herself and her sisters. Nothing will happen to us, inshallah, God willing. But if something happens to us, you and Dad must know that we are dead for knowledge, and you and Father must keep your heads held high. I mean, the courage, it's just incredible. She knew exactly what the risks were. One part of the story I don't tell in the TED Talk and I don't get to talk about much, but I'll mention here, is the courage of the mother. The mother was then so outraged by what had happened to her daughter that she walked home through the streets of the town of Sidi Musa, which was at that time under curfew in one of the most dangerous places in Algeria, screaming at the top of her lungs, denouncing the GIA terrorists who had killed her daughter. And the police came later to the family home and said, you know, if more people had sort of done what you did, maybe we would have less of this killing here, but your whole family's gonna have to leave immediately. Uh, so they, the, the entire family then fled in the morning. So the, the courage of this family, of this mother, of this daughter, just blow me away. And the loss, the suffering. Um, and I think about this again and again. Amel Zanoon's watch stopped at 517. It's just unimaginable. So I found myself in part, and I think even when I'm still in discussions like this, trying to find Amel's hope, going out there and looking for it. And her name means hope even in Arabic. And I think I found it in two places. I found it in the strength of her family and all the other families and continuing to tell their stories. Uh, some of the people who told me awful stories are here in this room. I found it in the fact that Emel Zanoun lives on today wherever women and men continued to defy the fundamentalists, like people I met in Afghanistan and Pakistan, like people who are assembled here. Uh, I think Emel's hope lives on in us and in this room when we continue this work, which means we have such a moral imperative to continue it and to find better and better ways of doing it. 517 is still coming to too many ML Zanoons, and at the end of the day, we know that that is a reality we absolutely cannot tolerate. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much, uh, Karima. That was brilliant, uh, inspiring presentation. Plenty of things on the strategy. I think it's so important for the conference to actually think about.